thanks to that uh, <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful music from the Oratorio Choir, from Brother Staley, who upholds the tradition of Enterprise Utah, and to Brother Radshaw for, uh, for composing it. Thank you, Merrill. My thanks to my colleague and friend and brother, uh, Bob Matthews, for the prayer in our behalf uh, this morning. It's a pleasant coincidence for me to be addressing the student body on the morning that uh, the naming of a new building for President N. Eldon Tanner is announced. It's been my good fortune and blessing to be associated with President Tanner longer than my years uh, should allow. I first met President Tanner 20 years ago as a missionary in Great Britain when uh, he, as a newly called general authority, was then presiding over the West European missions. That introduction has led to many hours and many months and now some years of special association for me. It's most appropriate that the Board of Trustees of Brigham Young University, a board chaired by President Spencer W. Kimball, would choose to honor this unique and remarkable man by naming for him the BYU building, which will house the School of Management and other business and administrative programs. First a school teacher, then a public servant, the next a uniquely, remarkably successful businessman, and finally a counselor to four presidents of the Church. And Eldon Tanner has throughout his life been a man of God. I'm honored with you to be here this morning at the time of this announcement. I'd like to be <clears throat> personal this morning, personal about you and personal about me. I've thought about you a great deal and about this assignment, and I've prayed wanted to know what might be helpful to you. In doing so, I've been drawn back to my own, my own days as a student, some of the challenges that I faced then. And while those experiences now border on primitive history, fit only for a geology lecture, I'm nevertheless going to go ahead. Uh, I've wondered if perhaps some of your experiences and some of your feelings might not be the same. I come this morning uh, knowing that the term is nearly over and that some of what I have to say was probably needed months ago. <clears throat> Furthermore, the year is nearly over, and for some I suppose a college career comes to an end. But part of what I want to stress is that every day counts, including these few that remain in the term, and that you have thousands of days thereafter. I will speak to you as you are right now and hope that it matters as much to the graduating senior as it does to the first semester freshman. I wish to speak of a problem that I believe to be a universal problem and which can at any given hour strike anywhere on campus, faculty, staff, administration, especially the student body. I believe it is a form of evil. At least I know it can have damaging effects that block our growth, dampen our spirit, diminish our hope, and leave us susceptible and vulnerable to other more conspicuous evils. I address it here this morning because I know of nothing Satan uses quite so cunningly or cleverly in his work on a young man or a young woman in your present circumstance. I speak of doubt, especially of self-doubt and of discouragement and of despair. In doing so, I don't wish to suggest that there aren't plenty of things in the world to be troubled by. In our lives individually and collectively, there certainly are challenges to our happiness. I watch an early morning news broadcast while I shave, and then I read a daily newspaper. That's enough to ruin anyone's day, and by then it's only 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> Iran, Afghanistan, inflation, energy, jogging, mass murders, kidnapping, elections, floods. With all of this waiting for us, we're tempted, as W.C. Fields once said, to smile first thing in the morning and get it over with. But my concerns for you today are not the national and the international ones. I wish to speak a little more personally of those matters which do not make headlines in the New York Times but may be important in your personal journals. I am anxious this morning about your problems with school and with love and with finances and with the future, about your troubles concerning a place in life and the value of your contribution, if any about your private fears regarding where you're going and whether you'll ever get there. Against a backdrop of hostages and high prices, 
I wish to speak more personally of you and fortify you, if I'm able, against doubt, especially self-doubt and discouragement and despair. I come this morning to attack, to attack double-digit depression. In doing so, however, I wish at the outset to make a distinction F. Scott Fitzgerald once made, that trouble has no necessary connection with discouragement. Trouble has no necessary connection with discouragement. Discouragement has a germ of its own, as different from trouble as arthritis is different from a stiff joint. Now, troubles we've all got, but the germ of discouragement, to use Fitzgerald's word, is not in the trouble. It is in us, or more precisely, I believe it is in Satan, the prince of darkness, the father of lies. And he would have it be in us. It's frequently a small germ, hardly worth going to the health center for. But it will work, and it will grow, and it will spread. In fact, it can become almost a habit, a way of living and thinking. And there the greatest damage is done. Then it takes an increasingly severe toll on our spirit, for it erodes the deepest religious commitments we can make, those of faith and hope and charity. We turn inward and look downward. And these greatest of Christ-like virtues are damaged, or at the very least impaired. We become unhappy, and soon we make others unhappy, and before long Lucifer laughs. As with any other germ, a little preventive medicine ought to be practiced in terms of those things that get us down. There is a line from Dante which says, The arrow seen before cometh less rudely. President John Kennedy put a variation of that thought into one of his State of the Union messages. He said, The time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. The Boy Scouts say it best of all. Be prepared. That isn't just cracker barrel wisdom with us. It's theology. Prepare ye, prepare ye. Angels shall fly through the midst of heaven, crying with a loud voice, Prepare ye, prepare ye. And if you are prepared, you shall not fear. And fear is part of what I wish to oppose this morning. The scriptures teach that preparation, prevention, if you will, is perhaps the major weapon in your arsenal against discouragement and self-defeat. For example, if as a student you are like I was, you may be discouraged over money matters. And almost everyone is, at least some of the time. A recent national study indicated that financially related problems outranked all other factors in marital difficulty by a margin of three to one. And the pressure can be about that great on single students as well. If that shared misery is any consolation to you, take heart. You have friends. From the day I walked into my first college classroom until I staggered out the exit of my last, a period of time stretching over twelve years and four degrees. I was responsible for every cent of my education. I know that many in this audience are getting through school exactly the same way. Part-time jobs, loans, heavy summers, working spouses, an almost desperate plea for scholarships, postponed personal comforts, and all the rest. These things can be troublesome. But you have an obligation, to yourself if no one else, to see that they are not destructive. Prepare. The arrow seen before cometh less rudely. Take advantage at this tender age to learn to use a budget, to sit down at, at a table spread with your debts and come to grips with the economic facts of life. It's none too soon if you've made it to college and have still not had to establish some personal priorities to decide what you will have at the expense of some things you will not have. Get it down on paper and deal with it there. That's the counsel we give to husbands and wives and the same solution works for others. The alternative is to leave it churning in your stomach and your head and your heart, all of which are susceptible to their own forms of ulcer. I see the brethren labor over the wise use, the wise use of the Church's resources. I see President Oaks labor over it for the university. I hope soon to see someone labor over it for the nation. You can, con <laughs> you can consider it part of a very valuable education to labor over it in your own life. Plan. Prepare, budget, work, save, sacrifice, spend cheerfully on things that matter, 
Smile at an old pair of shoes. Pay your tithing. Cherish a used book. Though some of you may be living in almost desperate financial straits, I promise you there is a way. Such times may be burdensome. Such sacrifice may be hard. But it does not have to lead, in your case must not lead, to despair and destruction and defeat. In the words of Henry David Thoreau, most of the luxuries and many of the so-called comforts of life are not only dispensable, but they're positive hindrances to the elevation of mankind. Love your life, poor as it is. The setting sun is reflected from the windows of the almshouse as brightly as it is from a rich man's abode. Now, no one here need be so dramatic as to peer at me out of an almshouse. But you may be going without some things. You may even consider yourself to be poor. Well, love your life, poor as it is. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Quite apart from the financial challenge, schoolwork can be quite a drag. Hold your applause, please. <laughs> I suppose it's fair to say that math and English and economics and zoology can be discouraging on certain days, especially as finals approach. But a little preparation can work wonders here as well. Otherwise, it's the night before the papers due or the morning before the afternoon exam. And despair distills upon us as the dews from heaven. <laughs> I plead with you in making your university experience a pleasant and rewarding one, work conscientiously in the early weeks, and you'll work much more cheerfully at the end. I remember handing in a paper to Dean Bruce B. Clark, who sits on the stand, who was at the time the teacher of an English literature class I was taking. I loved the class, knew from the first day of instruction that three short papers would be due on clearly stated dates during the semester. Yet I left those papers in every case, I think, Dean Clark, until the night before they were due. I say that as if he didn't already know it. I remember Dean Clark handing one of them back to me, saying something like this, Jeff, you had the makings of a pretty good paper here. It's too bad you didn't spend any time on it. I was devastated. Here was the chairman of my major department, teaching only one class, that term as I remember, the very symbol of my academic hopes and the dreams for the BA at BYU saying you didn't work very hard. Oh, I'd work hard all right. From nine o'clock the night before until three that morning. I didn't stop, I hardly breathed. Now, my young brothers and sisters, I deserved to be devastated. I should have been devastated. It could have been a good paper. Perhaps that's the thing that discourages me more than anything else. You see, I discouraged me. I discouraged myself. Remember, dear Brutus, the fault is not in our stars, it is in ourselves. And that's the worst kind of despair, the kind of self-despising that eats at our image and crushes our hopes. It isn't the class and it isn't the teacher and it isn't the paper. It never is. I should have done it better. I should have been at work sooner. I should have written a draft or two and then left it alone for a while. I should have gone back to it in freshness and strength. I might even have asked for some suggestions. I should have reworked it and shaped it and fine-tuned it over several rewritings. At the end, I should have been working with a scalpel. As it was, I delivered one butchered idea, the meat axe still dripping as I walked into class. And furthermore, you don't type very well at three in the morning. <laughs> the point is, with school as with money or marriage or professions or any hope or any dream, prepare, plan, work, sacrifice, rework, spend cheerfully time as well as money on things that matter and things that are of worth. Carry the calm and wear the assurance of having done all you could do with what you had. If you work hard and prepare earnestly, it will be very difficult for you 
to wear down or give in or give up. If you labor with faith in God and in yourself and in your future, you will have built upon a rock which when the winds blow and the rains come, and surely they will, you shall not fall. Of course, some things are not under your control. Some disappointments come regardless of your effort and your preparation, for I believe God wishes us to be strong as well as good. There too, I say, love your life poor as it is. Drive even these experiences into the corner, painful though they may be, and learn from them. In this too you have friends through the ages in whom you can take comfort and with whom you can form timeless bonds. Thomas Edison devoted ten years and all of his money to developing the nickel-alkaline storage battery at a time when he was almost penniless. Through that period of time, his small record and film production was supporting the storage battery effort. Then one night, a terrifying cry of fire echoed throughout the film plant. Spontaneous combustion had ignited some chemicals. And within moments, all of the packing compounds, the celluloid for the record, film and other flammable goods had gone up with a roar. Fire companies from eight towns arrived, but the fire and heat was so intense and the water pressure so low that the hoses had no effect. Edison was 67 years old. That is no age to begin anew. His daughter was frantic, wondering if he were safe, wondering if his spirits were broken, wondering how he would handle a crisis such as, this, such as this at his age. She saw him running toward her. He spoke first. He said, Where's your mother? Go get her. Tell her to get her friends. They'll never see another fire like this as long as they live. <laughs> At 5.30 the next morning, with the fire barely under control, he called his employees together and announced, We're rebuilding. One man was told to lease all the machine shops in the area, another to obtain a wrecking crane from the Erie Railroad Company. Then, almost as an afterthought, he said, Oh, by the way, does anybody know where we can get some money? Virtually everything you now recognize as a Thomas Edison contribution to your life came after that disaster. Please remember. Trouble has no necessary connection with discouragement. Discouragement has a germ of its own. If you are trying hard and living right and things still seem burdensome and difficult, take heart. Others have walked that way before you. Do you feel unpopular or different or outside the inside of things? Read Noah again. Go out there and take a few whacks on the side of your ark and see what popularity was like 2500 B.C. Does the wilderness stretch before you in a never-ending sequence of semesters? <laughs> Read Moses again. Calculate the burden of fighting with the pharaohs and then a 40-year assignment in Sinai. Some tasks take time. Accept that. But as the scripture says, they come to pass. They do end. We will cross over Jordan eventually. Others have proven it. I stand before you as a living symbol that anyone can make it through school, fill a mission, and get a job. Are you afraid people don't like you? The prophet Joseph could share a few thoughts with you on that subject. Has health been a problem? Surely you find comfort in the fact that a veritable Job has led this church into one of the most exciting and revelatory decades of this dispensation. President Kimball has known few days in the last thirty years which were not filled with pain or discomfort or disease. Is it wrong to wonder if President Kimball has in some sense become what he is not only in spite of the problems but in part because of them? Can you take courage from your shared sacrifice with this giant of a man who has defied disease and death and despair and has shaken his fist at the forces of darkness and cried when there was hardly strength left to walk, O oh Lord God, I am yet strong. Give me one more mountain. Do you feel untalented or incapable or inferior? 
Would it help you to know that everyone else feels that way too, including the prophets of God? Moses initially resisted his destiny, pleading that he was not eloquent in language. Jeremiah thought himself a child and was afraid of the faces he would meet. And Enoch, I ask you all to remember Enoch as long as you live. This is the young man who, when called to a seemingly impossible task, said, Why is it that I have found favor in thy sight? I am but a lad, and all the people hate me, and I am slow of speech. But Enoch was a believer. He stiffened his spine and squared his shoulders and went stutteringly on his way. Plain old, ungifted, inferior Enoch. And this is what the angels came to write of him. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God and their enemies came to battle against them. And he spake the word of the Lord. And the earth trembled and the mountains fled even according to his command, and the rivers of water were turned out of their course, and the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness, and all nations feared greatly, so powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. Plain old inadequate Enoch, whose name is now synonymous with transcendent righteousness. The next time you're tempted to paint your self-portrait sort of dismal gray out, outlined by lackluster beige, just remember that so have this kingdom's most splendid men and women been so tempted. And I say to you, as Joshua said to the tribes of Israel, as they faced one of their most dis difficult tasks, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. There is, of course, one source of despair more serious than all the rest. It is linked with poor preparation of a far more serious order. It is the opposite of sanctification. It is the most destructive discouragement in time or eternity. It is transgression against God. It is depression embedded in sin. Here your most crucial challenge, once recognizing the seriousness of your mistakes, will be to believe that you can change, that there can be a different you. To disbelieve that is a satanic device designed to discourage and defeat and destroy you. When you get home tonight, fall on your knees and thank your Father in heaven that you belong to a church and have grasped a gospel which promises repentance to those who will pay its price. Repentance is not a foreboding word. It is, following faith, the most encouraging word in the Christian vocabulary. Repentance is simply the scriptural invitation for growth, for improvement, for progress, for renewal. You can change. You can be anything you want to be in righteousness. If there's one lament I cannot abide, and I hear it from adults as well as students, it is the poor, pitiful, withered cry, well, that's just the way I am. If you want to talk about discouragement, that's one that discourages me. Though not a swearing man, I'm always sorely tempted when hearing that. Please spare me your speeches about that's just the way I am. I've heard that from too many people who wanted to sin and call it psychology. And I use the word sin again to cover a vast range of habits, some seemingly innocent enough which nevertheless bring discouragement and doubt and despair. You can change anything you want to change, and you can do it very fast. That's another satanic sucker punch, that it takes years and years and eons of eternity to repent. It takes exactly as long to repent as it takes you to say, I'll change, and mean it. Of course, there'll be problems to work out and restitutions to make, you may well spend, indeed you'd better spend, the rest of your life proving your repentance by its permanence. But change, growth, renewal, repentance, these can come for you as instantaneously as they came for Alma and the sons of Mosiah. 
And even if you have serious amends to make, it is not likely that you will qualify for the term the vilest of sinners, which is Mormon's phrase in describing those young men. Yet as Alma recounts his own experience in the 36th chapter of the book which bears his name, it appears to me that this change was as instantaneous as it was stunning. Do not misunderstand. Repentance is not easy or painless or convenient. It is a bitter cup from hell. But only Satan who dwells there would have you think that a necessary and, require, and required acknowledgement is more distasteful than permanent residence. Only he would say, you cannot change. You won't change. You've tried to change and you haven't. It's too long and too hard. Give up. Give in. Don't repent. You're just the way you are. That, my friends, is a lie born out of desperation, and I ask you not to fall for it. As you know, the Brethren used to announce in general conference the names of those who had been called on missions. Not only was this the way friends and neighbors learned of the call, more often than not it was the way the missionary learned of it as well. <laughs> One such prospect was Eli H. Pierce, a railroad man by trade. He would not been very faithful in church meetings. Quote, even had my inclinations led in that direction, which I frankly confess they did not, he admits. His mind had been given totally to what he demurely calls temporalities. He said he'd never read more than a few pages of Scripture in his life, that he'd spoken at only one public gathering, an effort which he said was no credit to him or those who heard him. And he used the vernacular of a railroad man in the barroom with a finesse born of long practice. He bought cigars wholesale, a thousand at a time, and he regularly lost his paycheck plane pool. Now this classic understatement. Nature never endowed me with a superabundance of religious sentiment. My spirituality, my spirituality was not high and probably even a little low. <laughs> Close quote. Well, the Lord knew what Eli Pierce was and he knew something else. He knew what I'm pleading for here today. He knew what Eli Pierce could become. When the call came, October 5, 1875, Eli wasn't in the tabernacle. That wasn't uh, peculiar. He was out working on one of the railroad lines. A fellow employee, once recovered from the shock of it all, ran out to telegraph the startling news. Brother Pierce writes, at the very moment this intelligence was being flashed over the wires, I was sitting lazily thrown back in an office rocking chair, my feet on the desk, reading a novel and simultaneously sucking on an old Dutch pipe, just to vary the monotony of cigar smoking. To my friends in the English department, I should say that I suppose reading the novel was a more serious transgression than smoking the pipe. <laughs> he goes on. <laughs> As soon as I had been informed of what had taken place, I threw the novel in the wastebasket, the pipe in a corner, and have never touched either to this hour. <laughs> I sent in my resignation to take effect at once in order that I might have time for study and preparation. I then started into town to buy scripture. Then these stirring words, remarkable as it may seem and has since appeared to me, the thought of disregarding the call or of refusing to comply with the requirement never once entered my mind. The only question I asked, and I asked it a thousand times, was, how can I accomplish this mission? How can I, who am so shamefully ignorant and untaught in doctrine, do honor to God and justice to the souls of men? and merit the trust reposed in me by the priesthood." Close quote. With such genuine humility, fostering resolution rather than defeating it, Eli Pierce fulfilled a remarkable mission. His journal could appropriately close on a completely renovated life with this one line, Throughout our entire mission we were greatly blessed. He was never to be the same again. But I add one experience to make the point. During the course of his missionary service, Brother Pierce was called to administer to the infant child of a branch president whom he knew and loved. Unfortunately, the wife of the branch president had become embittered 
and now seriously objected to any religious activity within the home, including a blessing for this dying child. With the mother refusing to leave the bedside and the child too ill to move, this humble branch president with his missionary friend retired to a small upper room in the house, there to pray for the baby's life. The mother, suspecting just such an act, sent one of the older children to observe and report back. There in that secluded chamber, the two men knelt and prayed fervently until, in Brother Pierce's own words, we felt that the child would live and knew that our prayers had been heard. Arising from their knees, they turned slowly, only to see the young girl standing in the partially open doorway, gazing intently into the room. She seemed, however, quite oblivious to the movements of the two men. She stood entranced for some seconds, her eyes immovable. Then she said, Papa, who was that man in there? Her father said, This is Brother Pierce. You know him. No, she said matter-of-factly, I mean the other man. Well, darling, there was no other man. Brother Pierce and I were praying for baby. Oh, there was another man, the child insisted, for I saw him. He was standing above you and Brother Pierce, and he was dressed all in white. Now, if God in His heaven will do that for a repentant, old, cigar-smoking, inactive, stern-swearing pool player, don't you think He'll do it for you? He will if your resolve and your promise is as deep and permanent as Eli Pierce's. In this church, we ask for faith not infallibility. Immerse yourself in the scriptures. You'll find your own experiences described there. You'll find spirit and strength there. You'll find solutions and counsel. Nephi says, The words of Christ will tell you all things that you should do. Pray earnestly and fast with purpose and devotion. Some difficulties like devils come not out save by fasting and by prayer. Serve others. The heavenly paradox is that that is the only way you can save yourself. Be patient. As Robert Frost said, the only way out is through. Keep moving. Keep trying. Have faith. Several decades ago, an acquaintance of mine left a small southern Utah town to travel east. He'd never traveled much beyond his little hometown and certainly had never ridden a train. But his older sister and brother-in-law, now living in the East, needed him under some special circumstances, and his parents agreed to free him from the farm work in order to go. They drove him to Salt Lake City and put him onto the train. New Levi's, not so new boots, very frightened and 18 years old. There was one major problem, and it terrified him. He had to change trains in Chicago. Furthermore, it involved an overnight layover, and that was a fate worse than death. His sister had written, carefully outlining when the incoming train would arrive and how and when and where he was to catch the outgoing line, but he was still terrified. And then his humble, plain, sun-scarred little father did something no one in this room should ever forget. He said, Son, wherever you go in this church, there will be somebody to stand by you. That's part of what it means to be a Latter-day Saint. And with that, he stuffed into the pocket of his calico shirt the name of a bishop he had taken the time to identify from sources at church headquarters. If the boy had troubles or became discouraged or afraid, he was to call the bishop and ask for help. Well, the train ride progressed rather uneventfully until it pulled into Chicago. And even then, the young man did pretty well at collecting his luggage and making it to the nearby hotel room, which had been prearranged by his brother-in-law. But then the clock began to tick, and night began to fall, and faith began to fail. Could he find his way back to the station? Could he find the right track? Could he find the right train? What if it was late? What if he was late? What if he lost his ticket? What if his sister had made a mistake and he ended up in New York? What if? What if? What if? Without those well-worn boots ever hitting the floor, that big raw-boned 18-year-old flew across the room, nearly pulled the telephone off the wall, and fighting back tears and troubles, called this bishop. Alas, the bishop was not home, but aha, the bishop's wife was. She spoke long enough to reassure him that absolutely nothing could go wrong that night. He was, after all, safe in the room, 
and what he needed more than anything was a night's rest. Then she said, If tomorrow morning you are still concerned, follow these directions. You can be with our family and other ward members until train time. We will make sure you get safely on your way. She then carefully spelled out the directions, had him repeat them back, and suggested a time for him to come. With slightly more peace in his heart, he knelt by his bed as he had every night of his eighteen years, and he waited for morning to come. Somewhere in the night, the hustle and bustle of Chicago in the 1930s distilled into peaceful sleep. At the appointed hour next, he set out. A long walk, then catch a bus. Watch for the stop. Walk a block, change sides of the street, one more bus. Count the streets carefully, two more to go, one more to go. Here it is. Let me out of this bus. It worked, just like she said it would. <laughs> then his world crumbled, crumbled before his very eyes. He stepped out of that bus only to see the longest stretch of shrubbery and, gla and grass he had ever seen in his entire life. She had said something about a park, but he thought a park was a dusty acre in southern Utah with a netless tennis court in the corner. <laughs> Here he stood, looking in vain at the vast expanse of Lincoln Park, with not a friendly face anywhere in sight. There was no bishop, no ward, no meeting house. And the bus, the bus was gone. It struck him that he had no idea where he was or what combination of connections with who knows what number of buses would be necessary to get him back to the station. Suddenly he felt more alone and overwhelmed than any moment in his life. As the tears welled up in his eyes, he despised himself for feeling so afraid. But he was, and the tears would not stop. He stepped off the sidewalk away from the bus into the edge of the park. He needed some privacy for his tears, as only an eighteen-year-old from southern Utah could fully appreciate. But as he stepped away from the noise, fighting to control his emotions, he thought he heard something hauntingly familiar in the distance. He moved cautiously in the direction of the sound. First he walked, then he walked quickly. The sound was stronger and firmer. And certainly it was familiar. Then he started to smile, a smile which erupted into an audible laugh, and he started to run. He wasn't sure that was the most dig dignified thing for a newcomer to Chicago to do, but this was no time for discretion. He ran, and he ran fast. He ran as fast as those cowboy boots would carry him, over shrubs, through trees, around the edge of a pool. Though hard to you, this journey may appear. Grace shall be as your day. The sounds were crystal clear, and he was now weeping newer, different tears. For there, over a little rise, huddled around a few picnic tables and bundles of food, was the bishop and his wife and their children and most of the families of this little ward. The date, July 24, 1934. The sound, a slightly off-key a cappella rendition of lines that even a boy from southern Utah would recognize. Gird up your loins, fresh courage take. Our God will never us forsake, and soon we'll have this tale to tell. All is well, all is well. It was Pioneer Day. The gathering to which he'd been invited was a 24th of July celebration. Knowing that it was about time for the boy to arrive, the ward had thought it a simple matter to sing a verse or two of Come, Come Ye Saints to let him know their location. Elisha, with a power known only to the prophets, had counseled the king of Israel on how and where and when to defend against the warring Syrians. The king of Syria, of course wishing to rid his armies of this prophetic problem, 
So said, and I quote, Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city round about. They compassed the city both with horses and with chariots. Now if Elisha is looking for a good time to be depressed, this is it. His only ally is the president of the local teachers' quorum. It is one prophet and one lad against the world, and the boy is petrified. He sees the enemy everywhere, difficulty and despair and problems and burdens everywhere. The bus is gone and all he can see is Chicago. With faltering faith, the boy cries, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha's reply, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. They that be with us? Now, just an Israelite minute here. Faith is fine, and courage is wonderful, but this is ridiculous, this little boy thinks. There are no others with us. He can recognize a Syrian army when he sees one, and he knows that a child and an old man are not strong odds against it. But Elisha's promise? Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, O Lord God, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. You write it down in your little black book that in the gospel of Jesus Christ you have help. And you have it on both sides of the veil. And you must never forget that one thing. When disappointment and discouragement strike, and they will, you remember and never forget that if your eyes could be opened, you would see horses and chariots of fire as far as the eye could see, riding at reckless speed to come to your protection. They will always be there, these armies of heaven, in defense of Abraham's seed. I close with this promise from heaven. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you are little children. You have not as yet understood how great blessings the Father hath in his own hands prepared for you. And you cannot bear all things now. Nevertheless, be of good cheer, for I will lead you along. I will go before your face. I will be on your right hand and on your left. And mine angels shall be round about you to bear you up. The kingdom is yours. The blessings thereof are yours, and the riches of eternity are yours. My beloved young brothers and sisters, oh yes, I promise you, we'll find the place which God for us prepared. And on the way, we'll make the air with music ring and shout praises to our God and King. And above all the rest, this tale will tell. All is well. All is well. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.